Silent Witch. Vol 3, Student Council Arc. V3C1, How Eyelashes Works. As Roth GT Silent Witch April 30, 2021 9 minutes. How can a disgrace to our family like you become student council? Just confess yourself? How in the world did you manage to win his highness over? Isabel Norton, the daughter of Count Kerbeck, shouted in a voice that echoed through the hallway, then she slammed her teacup on the floor. Monica gulped at the sound of shattering glass. Isabel also lifted up a stuffed animal that was displayed on the bedside table, and swung it up, before she slammed it against the wall followed by a muffled sound. Well, What's with the defiant look in your eyes? You seem to have no idea what you're getting into. Then I'll teach your body to make you understand. Isabel then slammed the stuffed animal against the wall with all her might. Then, she wiped the sweat from her forehead with a fresh face. Her current face was filled with a sense of accomplishment, like a craftsman who had just finished a job. So, how my villainous act was. Um... Monica was at a loss for a response but Agatha, Isabel's maidservant who was cleaning up the broken teacups, nodded with a smile. You are impressive as always, Lady Isabel? Your villainous daughter act was very brilliant. Right? Right? Especially the part of saying I'll teach your body to make you understand, from the latest book. It was really something. True? I've read it too. It's the scene where just as the Count's daughter raises her fork to scratch the heroine's face, the prince comes to her rescue. Yes, that scene is absolutely wonderful. Monica, who could not keep up with Isabel and her maidservant's excitement, sipped the tea that had been prepared for her, then said, I think, slamming your teacup on the floor, is a bit too much. When Monica glanced at her teacup, Isabel puffed out her chest with pride. Don't worry, it had cracks in it, to begin with. This is why I always keep chipped tableware in stock. I is that so? Oh, make sure to smash it on the marble, not on the carpet, so that the sound that it makes would resonate better. After hearing Isabel's meticulous explanation, Agatha was, as expected of Lady Isabel, you really know how to give instruction, while clapping her hands with a big smile. After Monica told Isabel that she had been appointed as treasurer of the student council, Isabel was jumping in joy. Then she invited Monica to her room to have some tea with her. As a wealthy student, Isabel had her own room in the dormitory and brought three maids. Among the maids, Agatha was the most junior who's apparently a reading buddy of Isabel. She also happily cooperated with Isabel's play of the role of villainous daughter. Is she okay with treating her lady as a villainous daughter? Isabel and Agatha seemed to be really enjoying themselves, and Monica was secretly having a hard time wrapping her head around it. Anyone who passed by this room would have mistakenly thought that Monica had been taken into Isabel's room and was being abused. But wouldn't this ruin Isabel's reputation? Despite Monica's concerns, Isabel put the stuffed animal back in place and sat back in her chair with a truly elegant posture. Well then, big sister Monica, let me say it again. Congratulations on becoming the treasurer of the student council. To be elected as a student council member just a few days after entering the school, as expected, you were really special. Isabel was squealing while putting her hand on her cheek, but Agatha looked out into the hallway and signaled her lady with her eyes as she brought her finger to her lips. My lady, SHH. If you speak too loudly, people in the hallway will hear you. Oh, you're right. Now, this may be less appropriate but congratulation on your assignment, big sister Monica. I was just happy as you. Monica who was meddling with her cup, spoke, thank you, in a faint voice. Tipping her cup gracefully, Isabel smiled graciously at Monica. 
The gesture and the smile on her face made it hard to believe that she was the same person who had been swinging the stuffed animal around. It was the smile of a perfect young lady. Big Sister Monica, if you have any problems in school life, please let me know. On the outside, I might be a brilliant villainous daughter who would interfere with your life, but when there are no people, I will fully support you. Monica nodded vaguely, wondering inwardly what did she mean by providing support while interfering with her. Her response might have made her getting headaches, but what her classmate would do was more than that. In fact, after being dragged away by Cyril, the student council vice president, Monica was skipping classes all day. On top of that, if her classmate knows that she's become a student council member, she can't imagine what they will do to her. Although she felt no cold, her body was shivering, so she sipped her black tea. On the next day, from the moment Monica left her room, she was subjected to the stares of everyone around her in the dorm, on the way to school, and in the classroom. Apparently, people were aware of the fact that Monica had become a student council member recently. Their gaze which until yesterday had been one of contempt for the bumpkin was now one of malice mixed with jealousy. And that was malice and hostility that prickled against her skin. Some whisper even had irritation and mockery mixed in. I wanna go home. Just thinking about that, it almost made her crying, but someone suddenly tapped her shoulder. Surprised, her whole body frozen then shaking heavily. She's afraid to turn around. That must be their signal to summon her before dragging her out to the back of the school then pouring a bucket of water on her. And now, her braid was held out which almost made her cry. Hey, you're going to wear that hairstyle today. The one staring at Monica with a discontent face was Lana Colette. Today, she had her hair neatly curled and hanging down from the sides. A flower motif hair ornament was pinned to the base of her hair. On the other hand, Monica was so depressed about going to school this morning that she didn't have the heart to practice her new hairstyle at all. At times like this, she tends to be more careless with her appearance, and her braids are more shabby than usual. Seeing Lana's eyebrows furrowed in displeasure, Monica quickly apologized. I I am sorry. I couldn't practice properly. Is that related to the fact that you were taken to the student council yesterday? I heard a rumor that you've become the student council. Is that true? Instead of wearing the badge that identified her as a student council member, she placed it inside her pocket. Lana's lips dejectedly pouted as Monica unconsciously put her hands in her pockets. Oh, you don't even want to talk to me. I it's not like that. I I. Looking at Monica was mumbling while put her gaze away, Lana briefly spoke, hand. Why did she hide her hands? As Monica alternated between her hand and Lana's, Lana grabbed Monica's arm absent-mindedly and immediately rolled up her sleeve. Monica gulped. Is her hand got injured? Did they do something terrible to her hands? While thinking something dreadful things Lana could think of, she gazed at Monica's wrist, then she exhaled with some relief. Sigh, I thought your hand was injured or something. Huh. Vice President Ashley used ice magic on you yesterday, didn't he? The ice handcuffs that were made to restrain you. That's why I thought you might have frostbite. Monica was touched as her tears were welled up. Yesterday. When Cyril put the ice handcuffs on her, Monica put up a defensive spell as soon as she could, so to not get frostbite. However, Lana, who didn't know this, was worried that Monica might have suffered from frostbite. It was like one of the fears she had until now was melting in her mind. Without her notice, she was crying while making a laughing face. Thank you. Although Lana gave her a snort, her cheeks were slightly red. Well, I guess I'll have to braid your hair again today. Haha. <laughs> Why are you giggling like that? At least, you should learn to braid your hair yourself. Hmm, 
Okay. Monica nodded her head, feeling strangely happy. So you had your friend did your hair yesterday? What a nimble hands. That soft voice was coming from a person that she had heard so much yesterday even she was pretty sick of it. Lana was surprised to hear such voices. Not just Lana, everyone was also surprised looking at the person that came into their class. Turning around with a pale look on her face, Monica's eyes met Felix's, who was smiling at her. His soft blonde hair which was glistening in the morning sun, his mysterious blue eyes, and his neatly shaped face were making the girls screaming in shrill voices. Those who were calmer didn't raise their voices, but they still looked at Felix with a passionate gaze. Despite her surprise, Lana also admired Felix's appearance. Good morning. Gee good moornai. I'm sorry for barging in so suddenly this morning. I just wanted to give you the schedule for the student council members. The surroundings stirred at Felix's words. Even Lana was staring at Monica with her eyes wide open. I really want to disappear from this place right away. Felix handed a piece of paper with a written schedule to Monica, who looked almost dying, before tracing her collar with his finger. Oh, where's your badge? You didn't wear it. W.L. Monica tried to ignore him by turning her head to the side, but Felix grabbed her by the chin and forced her to face him. Take out your badge. After Monica took out her badge in fear, Felix snatched it up and pinned it to Monica's lapel with his own hand. You can't just take it off without permission, okay? Now you're a member of the prestigious student council, so you should keep up an appearance worthy of that. I don't want to be a student council member, but to accomplish this mission, I don't have a choice but to do it. More than that, the gazes that gathered at her felt so pric cling. As scary. Also, the distance between them was so close. No, it's too close. That's why, to escape from that reality, Monica started counting the number of Felix's eyelashes. One, two, three, four, then she thought, his eyelashes got the same color as his hair and surprisingly it was pretty long. How many matchsticks can be put on there? Two, no, perhaps three of them? Along with counting the number of eyelashes, Monica also thought, to make it can support such matchsticks, she also had to consider the number of eyelashes needed to, the strength of each lash, the density of its growth. Not to mention, the angle of the lashes was also important. Still escaping from the reality as thinking all of this, Felix's long eyelashes lifted in front of her, following by his blue eyes twinkled playfully, he then looked up at Monica. What are you up to, staring at me like that? Peeputing. M matchstick. Matchstick. I was thinking about the best angle to put a matchstick on those eyelashes. Her classmates, including Lana, who had been watching with breathless anticipation were, wah, you idiot, in paled faces. But Felix's shoulder quivering after struggling to hold his laughter, and then he removed his hand from Monica's collar. You should ask your friend to make your hair pretty. Your hair was quite lovely yesterday. The ribbons looked good on you too. Felix finger combs a bit of Monica's hair and gives her a snappy wink. Well then, I'll see you after school. In the student council room. After that, Felix left the classroom. As for Monica, she sat on her chair weakly then took a deep breath. She was so tired. Morning just has started but she was already this tired. Now she just wanted to go back to her room and crawl into bed. As she was thinking this, Lana pushed Monica's shoulder and sat her down in a chair. Her eyes were blazing. You um. Monica nervously looked up at Lana, but the latter just snorted and held up her comb. Now my skills have been recognized by his highness, I can't send you off with an inadequate hairstyle, can I? So prepare yourself. I will make sure to have your hair look very trendy, stylish, and cute. 
Please just make it like yesterday. V3C2, the correct choice, ask His Highness to teach you. As Roth GT Silent Witch May 2nd, 2021 7 minutes. Sorry for the late post. After school, Monica who had reached the front of the student council room took a deep breath lifting her hand to knock, then stopped. For a while now, Monica has been repeating the same motion repeatedly. This was the 30th time she had taken a deep breath. The sight of her standing in front of the door of the student council room, taking deep breaths, was nothing but short of suspicious. Monica's mission was to eliminate the suspicious people near the second prince, but she was definitely the most suspicious person at the moment. T this time for sure. This time I will knock on the door for sure, or so determined Monica, but when she just about do that. Um, are you okay? Hearing someone's voice from behind had made her jump in surprise, which made her head hurt after it slammed into the door. Feeling guilty toward Monica who was now holding her head timidly, he bowed in apology. Ah, sorry for calling you out of the blue. Well, you've been taking deep breaths in front of the door for a while now, so I thought you might not be feeling well. It was a boy with light brown hair who approached Monica. He was rather small and looked young, but judging from the decoration on his sleeve, he was in the same grade as Monica. On his collar, he wore the same student council officer badge as Monica. He's a student council member as well? Now that she thought about it, she felt she saw other people in the archive room as well. But, since at that time she was too engrossed in reviewing those documents, she had paid no attention to it. While Monica squirming, the boy gave her a polite bow. I presume you are our new treasurer, Monica Norton? I'm Neil Clay Maywood, the general affairs assistant. It's nice to meet you. Since we are the only second year students on the student council, I hope we can get along. His bashful smile that had displayed toward Monica was of that a good person and Monica felt relieved to that. Inwardly, she's been worrying what if other student council members hated her, now that she saw there's had good people like him among them, it made her feel relieved. I might able to get along with them, or so she thought while patting her chest in relief. How long are you want to talk in front of the door? Hearing an angry voice echoed from her behind, her shoulder jerked. Turning her head around, she saw Cyril Astley, the student council vice president, staring at Monica with his arms folded. Monica Norton, because of your repeated weird behavior while standing in front of the door, I can't get in the room. Apparently, Cyril had seen Monica repeatedly taking deep breaths in front of the door. Um, vice president, were you watching her the whole time by any chance? When Noel said that in a low voice, he immediately covered his mouth after being glared at by Cyril. Cyril snorted haughtily glaring at Monica again. I don't care how did you make His Highness elected you as student council members, but I will never recognize you as one of us. After spoke that, Cyril opened the door to the student council room. Having urged by Neil, Monica could only timidly follow them. In the student council room, Three people were already seated there. Seated at the office desk in the center was the student council president, Felix. At a low table was a beautiful woman with light blonde hair and a young man with reddish brown colored hair with slanted eyes. They were checking some documents. Noticed at Monica who stood behind Cyril, he gave her a smile. Okay, I guess everyone's here. After Felix spoke those words, the rest members were naturally moved to the low table leaving the innermost seat and the last seat, empty. The seat next to Neil was probably Monica's seat. Felix took a seat at the far end before urging for Monica to be seated. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, student council has decided to replace our previous treasurer, Treasurer O'Brien, with Miss Monica Norton as our new student council officer. 
Listening to Felix's words with a solemn attitude were the vice president, Cyril, and a beautiful blonde woman. The reddish-brown-haired young man was looking at Monica with a somewhat amused look in his eyes, while Neil was nervously looking at his seniors. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Felix Ark Ridile, who served as the student council president. Since Felix has stood to introduce himself, everyone also obliged to introduce themselves. Cyril, the vice president, opened his mouth with a bitter look on his face. Cyril Astley, served as the student council vice president. Monica could feel his hostility towards her from his sharp voice. While Monica cowered, the reddish-brown-haired young man leaning against the backrest lazily, then lifted one hand. I'm Elliot Howard, served as the secretary. Nice to meet you. Elliot was a young man with slightly slanted eyes with a frivolous air about him. The next person to speak to was a beautiful young lady with beautifully coiffed light blonde hair. I'm Bridget Graham, served as the secretary. Bridget gave her name nonchalantly without looking at Monica. After her quick self-introduction, she covered her mouth with a fan without another word. Finally, Neil who was sitting next to her shyly introduced himself to Monica. I'm Neil Clay Maywood, serving as general affair assistant. I have introduced myself earlier, haha. In the still tense atmosphere, Neil's laughter echoed hollowly. To soften that atmosphere, Felix opened his mouth. Well then, now is your turn to introduce yourself, Miss Monica Norton. Oh, why did she has so many opportunities for hateful self-introduction these days? If she could, she would run away right now. If I run here, Lewis will scold me, Lewis will scold me, Lewis is scaring me, Lewis is scaring me. So Monica imagined Lewis Miller as her fellow seven sages, in her mind. Oh, my colleague? You can't even introduce yourself properly? Ha 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 ha, you sound like a dying cicada. Since when did cicada become my colleague? If you're so incompetent, people will think I, as your colleague as incompetent as you, will they? Now, if you understand, go straight up your spine, and turn yourself into a human being, you cicada girl? Just imagining it almost made her crying. So Monica introduced herself with a faint voice while sniffling. I I am Monica Norton. She said it. She actually said it. Although it bit stuttered, she did a good job introducing herself, or so she thought. But, how unsightly. The one who cut off Monica's self-introduction with a single word was Bridget. She looked at Monica with her amber eyes before covering her mouth with a fan before she spoke coldly. I've never heard of a student council member who couldn't even say his or her name properly. As Monica's shoulders jerked, Bridget gave her a cold glance before shifting her gaze to Felix. Your Highness, I don't believe this girl is qualified to stand in public. Please reconsider your decision before you bring the reputation of the student council down. Felix's smile was still as gentle as ever he closed his eyes in amusement. You don't like my choice. Yes. Without fear or flattery, Bridget plainly nodded to Felix, the second prince. Are there anyone else who thinks the same way? It was Cyril who reacted to this. Cyril stood from his chair clenched his fists, then made a powerful speech. Your Highness, I am of the same opinion as Secretary Graham. I hope you could reconsider your decision. If you bring this little girl here, it will only disgrace our student council. Cyril insisted loudly, Elliot looked on in amusement, and Neil flustered. And Felix for some reason, he was chuckling. But even though his mouth was smiling, his blue eyes were shining somewhat coldly. You guys are funny. You keep your mouth shut while act as if he never existed when injustice happened to former treasurer Aaron O'Brien. And now you loudly denounce Miss Norton for something she has yet to do. The air in the room froze. Cyril turned pale and said, That's, 
as he hesitated, and Bridget sunk into silence expressionlessly. Monica did not know what kind of person the previous treasurer had been. However, from the flow of the conversation, she guessed that he had been forced out of the position of treasurer due to some kind of fraud. Remembering the inadequacy of the last year's accounting report, it was easy to imagine what he had done. Felix crossed his leg, smiling as beautifully as he could, and said, People without backing are easier to denounce, right? You don't have to worry about them attacking you back. The student council members' expressions hardened at the gentle, soft, yet chilling words. If Miss Norton misbehaves in any way, it will be my fault for appointing her. At that time, I promise I will resign as student council president. The student council members were horrified by this statement, but Monica was undoubtedly the one who was more surprised than anyone else. W. Wait, wait, why it? She honestly has a feeling she's going to screw up. She will. She's going to screw something up. After all, except when it came to numbers, Monica was just a plain, ordinary girl. As Monica clacked her teeth in a shudder, Felix clapped his hands lightly. Okay, we will end our talk here. So, without further ado, Cyril, please teach Miss Norton how to handle accounting. At Felix's instruction, Cyril opened his mouth with a look of extreme frustration on his face. But he swallowed his objections, bent his mouth into shape, and nodded grudgingly. As you wish. Cyril raised his head as he glared at Monica. His eyes were blazing with hostility filled with murderous intent. He even made a gnashing noise. Of all people, why it has to be him who's going to teach her how to do her job? Frightened at that sight, Monica looked up at Felix. You um, I think, being taught by the vice president is. You know, Cyril's been acting treasurer for a while now after we got the previous treasurer to quit. Stopping his words, he looked into Monica's face in amusement. Did you perhaps want me to teach you? And no, I just hope, T the person who would teach me, was someone with similar grade to me. In other words, it was the most mild-mannered looking boy, Neil. I see. Felix smiled kindly and said. Work hard with Cyril's lesson. Heek. V3C3, Talent and Curse. As Roth GT Silent Witch May 3, 2021 6 minutes. Cyril Ashley, the eldest son of Marquis Hyon, was not originally from the Ashley family. Since the current Marquis Hyon only had a daughter, Cyril, as the most talented of their distant relatives, was chosen as his adopted son. Even though they had a blood relation to the Marquis of Hyon family, Cyril's family didn't have any peerage title, which placed them at the bottom rank. Even so, Cyril was so talented to be even chosen as their adoptive son. Having status like that in his school had made him proud, thinking that he was an outstanding person or was a chosen one. But Cyril, who was proud and delighted after became the adopted son of the Ashley family, met the Ashley family's daughter. And it made him despair. The daughter of Marquis Hyon Cyril's stepsister had outstanding intellect. The house of Marquis Hyon was said to be a family of intellectuals. And his stepsister was so intellectual that even made such Cyril can't even compare to her. If that's the case, why did they adopt him? Cyril, on the verge of losing the meaning of his own existence, desperately tried to learn about every possible field. However, the gap between her and his stepsister never seems to be closing. In fact, the more he learned, the more he realized the difference between himself and his stepsister. It was at this time when he was at the very low, the second prince, Felix Arkridile reached out to him. Will you lend me your strength? Cyril Ashley. At that time, Cyril said he didn't have that intellectuals, but Felix only smiling before gave him a response. I didn't choose you because you're from the Ashley family. 
I chose you because you're you, Cyril. At that moment, he made up his mind. From now on, he decided to devote all his life to this person. As treasurer, your job will become busy at the end of the month and the beginning of the month. I'll list all the things that must be done here, so make sure there are no omissions. Cyril Ashley was blatantly aggressive towards Monica, but he still explained the job thoroughly. The only thing that bothered her was that there was one large glass on the table. During his explanation, Cyril would briefly chant an incantation before dropping one or two ice cubes into the empty glass. Having become curious about the situation, once the explanation was done, Monica spoke up timidly. You um, what are you going to do with that ice? Each time you make a mistake, one of these ice cubes would be shoved into your mouth. He. Cyril nervously fiddled with the brooch on his collar with his fingers before he dropped another ice cubes into his glass. Monica suddenly realized. The cold air that had been scattered around him had subsided during the time Cyril was making the ice cubes. Could it be the reason he's making these ice cubes was for this? If you have time to look around, look through the documents. I'm sorry. Monica hurriedly turned back her gaze to the documents, but to be honest, the current job she has was not that complicated. In the first place, before coming to this school, Monica had been forced to work with all kinds of numbers, such as finances, cashier's records, product sales trends, demographics, and so on. Compared to that, the current accounting work was nothing. After finishing his explanation, Cyril spun his ice-filled glass around as he snorted in displeasure. I've been planning to shove this into your mouth, in case you have bad at memorizing things, but, apparently it was not necessary. It seems those words meant as the passing grade from Cyril. After patting her chest in relief, she was glared at by Cyril. Why are you acting so jumpy and timid? You um... E.E.R. In fact, I don't like that servility attitude of yours. That's something Monica used to be told. Why are you being so servile? You should be proud of your talent. If you despise yourself, what about those who are not even close to your talent? You've been chosen by His Highness. And your talent also has been acknowledged by him. So, why don't you show any pride in it? Don't be so servility. Don't despise yourself. Have confidence in yourself. You have a talent. How many times has she been told that when she mastered the no chanting spell? Even with that said, Monica couldn't refuse them. It's not that she denied her pride. Having pride in something you good at is a good thing. Believing in your talent is also a wonderful thing. If it were possible, Monica would want to be like that. But she can't do any of those things. I I am sorry. I just can't feel to be proud of myself. Monica said in muttering while she shook her head. It just impossible. In the past, when she was attending Minerva, Monica had only one boy she could call a friend. He took care of her because she was shy. Since she couldn't speak well in front of others, he accompanied her to practice her chanting and it had made Monica happy. But when Monica mastered no chanting spell and became known as a genius, their friendship began to deviate. I bet you've been looking down on me all along, haven't you? No, you got it wrong, was what she wanted to say, but those words didn't reach him. And without being able to reconcile with him, Monica graduated from Minerva and became one of the seven sages. It's a bitter memory that still lingers in Monica's mind, even now. Monica hung her head down, but Cyril's thin eyebrows furrowed as he bent his lips into shape. The word that I hate the most was impossible. Dot. I'm sorry. In response to Cyril's denunciation, Monica could only look down and apologize. He recalled when his father told him. He said talent can sometimes be a curse. For Monica, talent was a curse. 
It always took away the things that Monica wanted. Her father, her friends. Hello, are you progressing well? The cheerful voice brought Monica back to her senses. When she turned her gaze, Felix was peering at her desk. Cyril straightened his back and answered promptly. I've explained all of our regular duties and the work to be done at the beginning and end of the month. It just leaves to the things related to events. Oh, there will be a chess tournament and a school festival before the winter break. You'll have to tell her about those, too. I will. As Cyril nodded, Felix looked at the glass on the desk and lifted it lightly. The ice collided with each other, making a rattling sound. Are you not feeling well, Cyril? No, I'm fine. Your Highness. Well, that's good, but, take it easy, okay. What did that conversation mean, she wondered. Does Lord Ashley feel ill when he makes ice? The cold air that was being released on a regular basis, the ice that was purposely created in the glass, the brooch that was being touched nervously. To tell the truth, Monica had only one idea of what was going on. Is he perhaps? As Monica was staring at Cyril's brooch, a finger reached out from the side poked Monica in the cheek. If you look from the side, you will see Felix happily poked Monica's soft cheek. Don't just look at Cyril, look at me too. I I am sorry I. You? How dare you show such disrespect to his highness? I I I I. I'm sorry I I I I I I I. When Monica apologized, Cyril smacked the desk with his palms. Can't you speak clearly? I I I am so sorry. Who said you could speak in stuttering? Cyril, don't bully her too much, okay? Felix calmly restrained Cyril from shouting at her, but he said in a stern voice, I'm not bullying her, your highness. I'm disciplining her. I thought disciplining was the owner's job. If so, it's my job. She felt that her human rights were being taken away without a second thought. For now, Monica decided to immerse herself in the task of counting Felix's eyelashes in order to escape from reality. V3C4, late night visitor, discussing about a shappy man. As Roth GT Silent Witch May 5th, 2021 6 minutes. Sorry for the late post. Lately, I've been busy with my work and didn't have enough time to translate. So I can only post one chapter in two or three days for the time being. Completing student council tasks was not hard, but it had depleted her mental energy. After eating and bathing, Monica went back to the girls' dormitory attic and collapsed on her bed. Welcome back, Monica. You've been working hard. Nero climbed on top of Monica, who was lying face down, then he pounced on her shoulder with his paw. The massage was a little weak, but it was still felt pleasant. Monica closed her eyes enraptured, breathing in comfy. Today, I've been lectured, by Lord Ashley. Oh, was that the chilly guy who always shouting at you? So, how hard did he lectured you? Is he tougher than Luau Rumpapa? Maybe, compared to Lewis, he's a hundred times better. Well, your colleague's indeed a devil. Cyril Ashley's hard attitude towards Monica has been drained her, to say the least, but his instruction was generous. He would list the things she needed to know, and if she had questions about something, he would tell her. Cyril, who has deeply admired Felix, was the kind of person who would take care of Monica as long as Felix ordered him to. In comparison, Monica's colleague Lewis Miller of the Seven Sages would slap her mercilessly whenever she stuttered, and would occasionally unleash a large attack spell. So as for Cyril who declared that he would throw ice into her mouth, it was looked somewhat kinder. Remembering the nightmare days when Lewis had lectured her, making her only want to slump down on her bed, but a knocking sound coming in. From the window, lifting her head, she saw a small bird pecked on the attic window. It was a beautiful bird with yellow-green feathers. 
Had the bird been kept by a nobleman escaped? The little bird pecked on the window again. And when Nero, the black cat, approached the window, it didn't seem to be frightened. Thinking in wonder, Monica then opened the window, so the little bird flew in, circled the room before finally landed on the floor. Its form was enveloped in fine particles of light, and in the next moment, it transformed into a human form. Standing there was a slender, tall maid. She had a beautiful face, somewhat doll-like, which she had seen several times before. You are. Louis's maid. To the muttering Monica, the maid plucked at the hem of her skirt, bowed, and introduced herself curtly. I am a contracted high spirit of Louis Miller the barrier magician, Lindbergh Field. Please, call me Lynn. Realizing she has been spouting rumors of Louis being the devil, Monica unconsciously straightened her back. The fact that Louis's contracted spirit, Lynn, had visited Monica, probably meant that he wanted her to report on the progress of her mission. You um, you're here for the reports, right? That's one thing, but first, I've got an urgent message from Master Lewis. Urgent in that case, it's an important message that needs to be delivered as soon as possible. Monica and Nero gulped, wondering what kind of message it was. Lynn opened her mouth impassively. I, Lewis Miller, from this now on I have. I have. Become a dad. We don't need that. We don't need that kind of information. Is it not different from a private message? Despite Nero's yelling, Lynn didn't seem particularly upset but just nodded her head. Yes, ever since his wife's pregnancy, Mr. Lewis has become a shappy man. A shappy man. When Monica recited a word that was not familiar to her, Lynn was only said, shappy then nodded in a mysterious manner. The word shappy is said to be unique to the western part of the kingdom which stands for extremely happy. Therefore, it is a word used for people who are overly joyous. I I see. Ever since I saw this word in a book, I have wanted to say it at least once. I am very excited to be able to use it now. Although Lynn said she was very excited, her expression was as blank as ever. It's hard to tell how earnest this spirit was. Um, please give. Louis and his wife, my congrats. You gotta be angry right there, Monica? That devil magician has put you on a very troublesome mission, and now he's getting happy by himself? You should be angrier. Nero raised his paw to insist on her, but Monica honestly just wanted to give them her congrats. Leaving aside Louis, She's been indebted to Louis' wife, Rosalie, a lot. Lynn was I will pass your message to them while nodding, then took a sheet of paper from her pocket. All right, since the main subject has been conveyed. That was the main subject. Ignoring Nero's retort, Lynn spread the paper she had taken out on the desk. Louis's handwriting was scribbled on the paper. I have been made aware of how incompetent you are with your oral reports. So be sure to write down all important reports on this paper and give it to Lynn. As expected of her colleague, he fully understood that Monica would not be able to convey half of the important information if she gives her reports verbally. I have been assigned to be the carrier pigeon for this mission. If you have any reports or messages for Lord Lewis, Please fill them out and leave them with me. I will send it to him right away. Um, what if there's nothing in particular to report? I'll be staying here in the attic. I I will write the report right away. Monica hurriedly moved the lamp to the desk and sat down in the chair. Fortunately, she has something to report. Being appointed as a student council member was a big step forward in guard duty. This was something that she could proudly report. And the other thing is, as she was thinking about what to report to, Nero twitched his whiskers before looking out the window. Hey, the backside of the boys' dormitory is kind of chilly. Huh. Monica who's puzzled by Nero's words, interrupted by Lynn. 
There is an ice mana reaction behind the boy's dormitory. I'm not sure if he's using it intentionally or not, but I think his mana is leaking out of control. An unpleasant premonition sent a chill down Monica's spine. The first person who came to her mind when she mentioned ice mana was Cyril Ashley. Um, Lynn, are you sure the ice mana reaction is outside and not inside the boy's dormitory? Yes, it is outside. He's outside moving slowly towards the dormitory grounds. Assuming this magical reaction was from Cyril, would the earnest man sneak out of the dormitory at this hour? But whatever the case, as the second prince's bodyguard, she couldn't overlook the unusual situation near the boy's dormitory. I I will go check on the situation. But hey, Monica. How are you gonna get out of the girl's dormitory? You can't use flight magic, can you? Ah, uh, Nero was right. Flying magic requires a good sense of balance, something that Monica, with her catastrophically poor motor skills, has never been very good at. Skilled users can fly freely, but for Monica, the best she can do was jump a little higher, such as when she climbed over the fence in the old garden. Ugh, what should I do? Monica opened the window to look down at the ground. Monica's room was in the attic of a four-story building, which meant it was naturally very high. Perhaps she could jump from here and soften the impact with wind magic before landing on the ground. But scary things are scary. While Monica shivering when looking down from the window, Lynn tapped Monica on the shoulder. If that's the case, leave it to me. Since I am a wind spirit, I specialize in flight magic. How dependable? Monica looked up at Lynn with respect, and Lynn put her foot on the window sill before saying, Please remember, my master said landing on high speed movement was very hard. So, please prepare yourself at the time we're landing. Please move slowly, Dean. Monica screamed, holding Nero to her chest. Your Highness. In Felix's room in the boys' dormitory, his servant, Will, approached him in a bewildered manner. Felix, who was sitting on the couch drinking tea, put the cup back in the saucer and looked at Will. Is it about Cyril? Yes, I sense a strong ice mana outside the dormitory. Can you locate the exact location? I apologize. I can only give you an approximate direction. Will lowered his eyebrows apologetically, but there was nothing he could do about it. He was only good at optical tricks and illusions, and his sensing ability was not that great. Now, what to do? We can't just leave him alone, after all. Let's go check on him a bit. V3C5, Overdose. As Roth GT Silent Witch May 9, 2021 6 minutes. Ever since he had been adopted to the house of Marquis Hyon and shown the difference between his and his stepsister, Cyril started his study to learn magic to obtain his own strength. After all, having a strong foundation in magic would give him some advantage in aristocratic society. He did have a talent for magic which his stepsister didn't. Born with higher mana than most people, he began to study hard but because of it, a disease was developing within him. Mana Overdose Syndrome Humans can only store mana in their vessel, but it can't generate mana from it. Instead, it can be recovered by absorbing small amounts of mana outside their body. Thus, a human body can't store more mana exceeded of their vessel. Once the vessel is full, their bodies will reject and would not absorb any more mana and the state when the vessel is full, but the body still judges that there is a lack of mana and continues to absorb mana on its own that is mana overdose. It may be similar to overeating. Just as the satiety center does not function properly, causing the body to seek food, Cyril's body didn't recognize his vessel was full and still absorbing more mana and the excess mana which ate away his body was the cause of mana overdose. Therefore, 
he needed to regularly release the excess mana that could not be contained in his vessel out of his body. According to his doctor, the symptoms were caused by repeated reckless training. When he had developed this disease, Cyril fell into despair. He was sure that he would be abandoned by the Marquis family. However, Marquis Hyon has prepared a magic tool for Cyril which can absorb and release his excess mana. That was the brooch he always wore on his lapel. The excess mana in his body will be absorbed and discharged from his body by wearing it. As long as he wore that brooch, he should have no trouble carrying on with his daily life. Then, why this is happening? Wandering through the forest behind the dormitory, Cyril chanted a short incantation, freezing the tree before him and turning it into an ice statue. With the use of spells, the amount of mana in his body will be reduced, giving him temporary relief. However, once again, Cyril's body quickly absorbed more mana. His recovery speed was clearly faster than usual. Way too fast, actually. No matter how many spells he used, the mana in his body did not empty out. In fact, it's only increasing. The excess mana that overflows from the vessel would eat away the human body, followed by their head throbbed with pain. And nauseous feeling. Kneeling down, Cyril grasped the brooch on his lapel as he crouched down. A custom-made brooch that Marquis Hyon his adoptive father had prepared for him. With this item, he should be able to absorb your mana. With this item, he should be able to control your overdose. With this item, he should be able to meet Marquis Hyon's expectations. I have to live up to his expectations. Cyril had been living a life that could hardly be called aristocratic, but he wanted to live up to the expectations of his adoptive father, who had accepted him into the Marquis family. He also wanted to live up to the expectations of the second prince, who had needed him and had chosen him as vice president. And more than that, he wanted to live up to their expectation. That was why Cyril should not be crawling on the ground here. But contrary to his intention, his body absorbed more mana on its own. Cyril chanted a quick incantation and unleashed his ice spell. So after freezing the rock in front of him, it should have eased his symptom, or so he thought, but his body kept absorbing mana. Although his mana absorption often went haywire when he was sick, this rate was still abnormal. Why? Why? Why did this happen? He had to chant quickly and use the next spell, but his pulse was erratic and his breathing was deranged. In this situation, he couldn't chant and use a spell. Ha! Ha! Cyril scratched the ground and convulsed, breaking out in a cold sweat. His eyes went black and his consciousness became distant, and that's when. He heard the cat's cry. With Lin's wind magic which was moved slowly at Monica's insistence, the group of Monica, Nero, and Lin, who had escaped from their dormitory room, following the traces of Mana into the forest before reached the shadows of the trees where Cyril was. He was writhing in agony, firing off a barrage of ice magic. Clearly, he was not in a normal state. His condition looks strange for training magic in secret. Monica nodded at Lynn's words. I think. Lord Ashley is having mana poisoning. Mana poisoning, spoke Lynn and Nero in sync. Apparently, neither of them knew anything about such a disease. See compared to spirits and dragons, the human body is less resistant to mana, so their body will worsen if they take too much mana in. And that state is called mana poisoning. In the worst case, it would lead them to death. Monica had seen a few people with the same symptoms when she was still enrolled at Minerva. Lord Ashley probably has a constitution that absorbs mana easily. These people usually use magic frequently to reduce their mana or wear magic tools that absorb excess mana. This was probably why Cyril constantly converted his mana into the cold air or made some ice block in his glass.
That's how he was releasing the excess mana in his body. He was so concerned about the brooch on his lapel that it was probably a magic tool for absorbing that mana. After hearing Monica's explanation, Lin formed a circle with her index finger and thumb and looked at Cyril through her finger. I have confirmed his mana flow. The brooch on his lapel seems to be collecting mana that was released outside his body and returning it to his body. I knew it. That magic tool is malfunctioning. That magic tool has functioning contrary to its intended. That brooch needs to be removed as soon as possible. However, if Monica approached, Cyril would ask why Monica was here. Although Monica was going out wearing a hooded cloak, if she gets close enough to touch the brooch, he will notice her presence. As Monica hesitated, Nero meowed bravely. Guess, I'll take care of it for you. Nero jumped out of the shadows of the tree and pounced on Cyril, caught the brooch on his collar with his mouth. A cat? Stop it, don't touch that. Cyril flailed his arms to resist but Nero easily dodged him to remove the brooch, which he then distanced himself from Cyril afterward. Give it back. Give it back. Shouting hysterically in bloodshot eyes, Cyril chanted a quick incantation. The path that Nero's heading toward was instantly blocked by a wall of ice. Ugh. Nero hurriedly changed his path and tried to escape into the forest, but the wall of ice spread vigorously to block Nero's escape path. Without realizing it, Nero and Cyril were surrounded by a wall of ice. This is bad. And I'm not very good with cooled. The chilling air flowing around his feet made Nero shrink back. Even so, he kept the brooch in his mouth and wouldn't let it go. Give it back. Give it back to me. Cyril approached Nero with bloodshot eyes. In between his ragged breathing, he heard Cyril spoke in a low voice. That brooch, was a present, from my father-in-law, to get his acknowledgement. I have. Cyril's eyes that clouded with obsession have lost his reasoning. Looking at his figure, Nero couldn't help but felt pity for him. Why are all humans so stupid? Perhaps he has his own reasons for being obsessed with this brooch. But it had nothing to do with Nero. Cyril chanted a quick incantation. More than a dozen ice arrows flowed up around him. Each of them was as thick as my arm and they were more like stakes than arrows. Whatever it was, a direct hit would not end well. I've been, acknowledged by, my father-in-law and, his highness, even so, why would? Cyril's feverish eyes looked hollowly at Nero. Even then, what appeared in his eyes was not Nero. While his whole body was being consumed by mana, wallowing in fever, what he saw was visions of someone Nero didn't know. Why? His neatly shaped face twisted into a pained and somewhat tearful expression. Why? Why would you not acknowledge me, mother? At that moment, the ice wall collapsed without a sound. The ice wall and arrows that floated around Cyril were burning engulfed in flames. The ice that Cyril had created melted and disappeared in less than a few seconds, and the flames that had melted the ice gathered in one place as if they had a will of their own, eventually becoming a flame serpent. And standing on the other side of the crumbling ice wall was a petite witch with her hood pulled up tightly over her eyes. And she was one of seven sages, a user of no chant magic. Monica Everett the Silent Witch. V3C6, a silent monster. Azroth GT Silent Witch May 10th, 2021 8 minutes. Although Cyril's father had the blood of the Marquis Hyon family flowing in his veins, he had no title and was never wealthy. Even so, his father was so proud of it to the point of not getting work and acting arrogantly towards his mother. Cyril didn't like that attitude, so he always took his mother's side. In his own way, he tried to make his mother happy. But, every time his mother saw his face the face that reminded her of his aristocratic father's face she always made a sad face. Eventually, 
By the time his father died drowned in alcohol, a member of the Marquis Hyon family came to his house to make an offer to adopt Cyril. Cyril was overjoyed when he heard that news. It will ease my mother's life for sure, and I will make my mother happy, but his mother, who saw Cyril's happy face, only let out a sigh before saying, Ah, you really are from a noble family, a son of a noble family. No, I'm not, mother. I am your son. Just that one sentence was the thing he couldn't say to his mother. In front of Cyril's eyes was a figure with a hood pulled tightly over her eyes. That person had a small figure and did not look like an adult. But as soon as the figure lightly lifted her right hand, the serpent that had melted Cyril's ice wall circled around by the hooded figure. And he sure that the person in the hood was a magician the one who melted his ice. The black cat that took Cyril's brooch meowed and ran up to the hooded figure. The hooded figure lifted up the black cat and picked up the brooch in the cat's mouth. So that cat, was your cat. Despite Cyril's low growl, the hooded figure paid no attention to him, instead, she only looked at the brooch. This attitude irritated Cyril even more. Give that brooch back. In a rage, Cyril chanted a spell to create an ice chain. Cyril snapped his fingers, and the hooded figure's limbs were entangled in ice chains but in the next moment, the ice chains were dissolved. What? The hooded figure hadn't done anything. He did not even saw that figure chanting. And yet, the ice chain shattered without a trace, scattering to the ground. Did I perform the wrong spell? Cyril recited the spell again. But the result was the same. The ice chain disintegrated as soon as it manifested. How, how, have you done something to me? The hooded figure continued to stare at the brooch without saying a word. As if Cyril was not even in sight. And that kind of attitude felt so bizarre. Answer me. Cyril created an ice arrow and shot it at the hooded figure. However, just before his arrows reached the hooded figure, it was engulfed in flames and melted, disappearing. Could it be, Cyril thought, she had allies around? Otherwise, it was inexplicable. The person in the hood was not even chanting. There was no way for a person could possibly neutralize Cyril's spell without chanting. Damn you, damn you. Cyril made a large number of ice arrows and shot them out in all directions in a random. If there were any of this hooded figure's allies around, he wanted them to reveal themselves. However, the hooded figure just glanced up slightly, and with that, his ice arrows were engulfed in flames and disappeared without a trace. What was that? What the hell was that? Blocking arrows fired in a random with a shield was not that difficult. But to be able to counteract every arrow that was shot in random, that's the feat beyond human. What Cyril saw in front of him now was that kind of spell. Moreover, the flames that melted the ice disappeared without spreading to the surrounding trees. In other words, she had used such spells with that kind of precision. Each flame was woven together with frighteningly precise calculations. She cast that many spells in less than a few seconds. What is this? What's going on? What am I looking at? For anyone who was not familiar with magic, they would have been taken aback by the flamboyant-looking flaming serpent. But for someone who has dabbled in magic for even a short time, they would have noticed the small flame that struck down the ice arrow was unusual. The fundamental defense in magical warfare is the shield in other words, the protective barrier. However, the person in front of him intercepted his arrows without using a shield, showing Cyril the overwhelming difference in skill. What are you? What the hell are you you? Cyril relinquished his fine control and converted all the mana he had into the cold wind, which he blasted at the hooded figure. Freeze? Freeze? I will freeze you into a mute ice statue. The cold wind that he let out while screaming hysterically froze everything around Cyril. 
the ground, the trees, and even Cyril himself. It didn't matter if his limbs were frostbitten or not, Cyril continued to blow cold wind at her. But then he realized. His full power cold wind was slowly being pushed back or rather, deflected. Up to the sky, the hooded figure was using a wind spell to deflect Cyril's cold wind. At the same time, the ice that had been stuck to Cyril's limbs gradually peeled off followed by a barrier that had been placed over Cyril's body to protect him from the cold wind. Of course, Cyril didn't cast a barrier, as he was using his spell without regard for his own safety. Did this person, the hooded figure cast a wind spell to deflect the cold wind while protecting Cyril's body with a defensive barrier, which means, the hooded figure has been using those advanced spells simultaneously. The hooded figure's allies must be the ones who used the technique secretly, hiding in the surroundings. That must be it. But, what if that's not the case? If this hooded figure alone was capable of using those many spells, then that would make that hooded figure a monster. Cyril went pale and his whole body shuddered. The excitement and intoxication that he felt when he was exercising his spell subsided, and the blood drained from his entire body. Ah! Uh, everything in front of his eyes became hazy as strength drained from his body. He had run out of mana. Just before he lost consciousness, Cyril saw that hooded figure ran up to him in a clumsy manner before extending her small hand. Hey, are you okay? Monica rushed over to Cyril with a clumsy running style before putting his head in her lap to make sure he was okay. Cyril was unconscious. His pulse was weakening a little, but it didn't seem to be life-threatening. He should be able to recover after a short rest. Thank goodness. The early symptoms of mana poisoning are feeling a strong excitement to use spells, that's what she knew. If it gets worse, Symptoms such as hallucinations, heart palpitations, and dizziness will occur, and finally, the whole body will be eroded by mana, leading to death. Therefore, the quickest way to treat people who suffer from mana poisoning in the early stages is to let them use their mana until it's empty. Well done. Lin, who had been watching in the shadows, came into view and saw the brooch in Monica's hand. Did you find something wrong with that magic tool? Yes, the formulas that were built into it had deteriorated over time. In fact, to prevent deterioration, these formulas are usually covered with layers of protective formulas. Are you saying there was no protective formula on it? When Monica nodded at Lin's words, Nero said, isn't defective product then, wagging his tail in annoyance. Good grief, who the hell did that lousy job? Well, their name should be inscribed on the back of the brooch. Turning the brooch over, Monica's cheeks tensed when she saw the name engraved on it. Emmanuel Darwin the Jewel Magician. What? You know this guy? Monica was at a loss for a response, but Lynn replied matter-of-factly. Like Miss Monica, I believe he is one of the seven sages. He does not get along with Louis. He is a member of the Second Prince. A money-grubbing baboon geezer, according to Sir Louis. Nero was silent for a few seconds before he opened his mouth. Is there no decent people among the Seven Sages? It was a painful statement to hear. Hearing that sentence, Monica who still overriding the brooch with a new magic formula, clutched her chest in pain. Magic that adds mana to this kind of material was called ancillary magic. Monica was not a specialist in ancillary magic, but this brooch was not so complicated to make her difficult modifying it. For example, the amulet that Lewis made for Felix. It was a very advanced magic tool to sense danger and set up a protective barrier. But this brooch only has a function to absorb and release mana. The amount of mana absorbed can be adjusted according to the amount of mana remaining in his body. Might I put on it an auto-adjustment formula? 
Monica has a bad habit of wanting to apply any kinds of magic formulas when she sees it. But, it would confuse Cyril if the function of the brooch suddenly changed. Monica then fixed the problem with the magic formula, incorporating only the auto-adjustment formula, followed by a double application of the protection formula to protect the formula. This should keep it from breaking down too easily. As Monica reattached the brooch to Cyril's collar, Nero looked up at Monica as if to mock her. Do you really need to go that far? I think you can get at least five gold coins just to repair a magic tool. Well, Monica trailed off, trying to collect her words, then stopped. Monica was just a little bit jealous of Cyril. The fact that he can be proud of being acknowledged by someone else. And how he was willing to work hard for it. Monoabsorbing constitution is often inconvenient, but if you get used to it, it can give you an advantage as a magician. The faster the mana you can absorb, the faster the mana you can recover. The faster you recover, the more advantage you will have over other magicians in the long run. As a matter of fact, some magicians were willing to go to extreme lengths to increase the speed at which they absorb mana, and push themselves to achieve this constitution. And such constitution of Cyril's could be called a talent. I don't want. He thinks of this talent as a curse. For Monica who can't seem to be proud of her talent, she could only think this was a curse. For that reason, she didn't want Cyril to become like her. She wanted him to be confident and proud of himself. And for Monica who can't be proud of herself. By the way, what are you going to do with him? Do you want to leave him here? Nero squeezed Cyril's cheek with his paw. Certainly, it's not winter yet. But it was still uncomfortable to leave a sick person lying in the woods like this. As Monica pondered what to do, Lynn gave her suggestion. Shall I blow this human body away with a gust of wind and throw it into the boy's dormitory? I if possible, please do it more peacefully. Then, let me create a tornado to blow him into the boy's dormitory. It's just getting worse. However, even Lynn have sneaked into the boy's dormitory with her flying spell. She couldn't bring him to his room because she didn't know where Cyril's room was. As Monica pondered what to do, Nero let out a sigh of exasperation before did a jumping. Once he spun around and landed on his feet, his appearance was no longer that of a black cat, but a young man with black hair and golden eyes. Let me carry him to the gate of the boy's dormitory. I'll leave him there so the gatekeeper will notice it. Do we really have to leave him outside? If we sneak inside and they find us, we're screwed. After saying that, Nero crudely lifted Cyril's body up before carried him onto his shoulder. Um, Nero, at least give him a piggyback ride. Ignoring Monica's voice, Nero lightly kicked the ground and started running. Eventually, Nero's back melted into the night forest before disappearing from sight. V3C7, Nero and Felix. As Roth GT Silent Witch May 11, 2021 6 minutes. Nero, with Cyril on his shoulders, was running through the forest at night without a single light. Despite in human form, Nero could still see clearly in the night. In addition, he was much stronger than a human, so even with Cyril on his shoulder, he was able to run at full speed. How did this chilly guy get out of the dormitory? I wonder. Both the boys' and girls' dormitories were surrounded by high walls. The gates were guarded by gatekeepers who keep watch throughout the night, so it must not be easy to sneak out. It would be a different story if he could use wind magic to leap or fly, but flight magic was not as easy as it sounds. Monica once told him that only advanced magicians could handle it because it requires both highly precise magic manipulation techniques and physical abilities. Aside from her magic skills, Monica's physical skills were very terrible, so jumping up high was the best she could do. The way I see it, 
This chilly guy excels in ice magic, but he doesn't seem to be very good at other magics. Since birth, each human is born with a set of attributes that they are good at. It is not uncommon for ordinary magicians to be able to use only their dominant attribute of magic. Monica's ability to easily use high-level magic, regardless of the attribute, was quite exceptional in many ways. Sometimes he almost forgot about it. I guess this chilly guy can't use wind magic. Well, using this much ice magic at his age is amazing enough, though. How did Cyril, who can't use flight magic, manage to sneak out of the boy's dormitory? The answer was quickly discovered when he reached the back of the boy's dormitory. There was a crack in one of the walls surrounding the dormitory. Apparently, Cyril had snuck out from there. I guess even the most prestigious schools are sloppy in their management. I heard that crack was used by previous generations of students to sneak out of their dorms and relax. A response came from behind Nero. With Cyril on his shoulder, Nero turned his head and saw a familiar male student standing there. Sleek and tall, with a perfect facial structure and golden hair that shined softly under the moonlight that was the second prince of the kingdom of Ridile, Felix Arc Ridile. In his uniform, Felix was holding a slightly larger board in his hand. Once Nero turned his attention to the board, Felix propped it up against the wall so that it covered the crack. Cyril usually puts up a board to hide this crack, but it seems he didn't have enough time to do so. So this crack was a loophole that even the prince was familiar with. Convinced, Nero put Cyril down from his shoulder. I'm just a traveler passing by. I came here to deliver this chilly guy who was collapsing in the woods after his magic poisoning got out of control. I'm kind, aren't I? You should be grateful. Yeah, thanks for going to the trouble. If this chilly guy says anything, just tell him he's hallucinating because of his magic poisoning. Everything he's seen is a hallucination. Hmm. Felix glanced at Cyril, then quickly returned his gaze to Nero. His gentle expression did not change but his blue eyes are watching Nero warily. A kind traveler. Can I ask you for your name? My name isn't worth mentioning, but since I'm being nice, I'll tell you my name. I'm Bartholomew Alexander. Once Nero spoke a lie blatantly, Felix put his hand over his mouth to hold his laugh. I don't expect you have the same name as the hero of the adventure novel. You know Dustin Gunther. In Nero's mind, Felix's likability has increased a little. Nero firmly believes that there's no bad guy who liked Dustin Gunther. As Nero's voice became more excited, Felix chuckled. I've enjoyed every kind of entertainment this country has to offer. Whether it's novels, games, theater. Is women too. When Nero, who has witnessed Felix going out for nightlife, pricked him, Felix only smiled vaguely and said, I wonder. What a creepy human. He was born into royalty, blessed with all kinds of things but he has empty eyes, like a person who possessed nothing. Felix lightly carried Cyril and then looked at Nero as if he had just recalled something. By the way, did you know, traveler? The forest in this area is school property, so it's off limits to everyone except school officials. Oh, is that so? The thing that Nero hated was to be forced to follow human rules. I'm not human, to begin with. Didn't care what kind of rules that humans have made, Nero only indicated Cyril with a tuck of his chin. I saved that chilly guy of yours. So give me a little slack. Yes, of course. I wouldn't dare question you for saving Cyril's life. Oh. Nero frowned scornfully and thrust his hand into his own robe. He then rummaged around in his clothes and made a gesture as if he was trying to catch something. You don't have to question me because this guy's going to find out who I am. With that, Nero pulled his hand out of his robe. At the tip of his fingers, 
A white lizard with its tail plucked was swaying placidly. Nero lifted the white lizard to his face level and threatened to eat it, and the white lizard flailed its small limbs and went wild. Nero laughed viciously, baring his sharp teeth. A water spirit, I guess. I'm sure you were planning to sneak a spy in my clothes, but too bad. I'm very sensitive to mana. A spirit was something like a mass of mana. So, the more high-ranking the spirit was, the more easily Nero could detect it. This white lizard was a high-ranking water spirit. Most likely, the prince's contracted spirit. Felix was still smiling serenely when confronted with the white lizard. That's what makes it so creepy. As for Nero, W what, or who the hell are you, were the reactions he was expecting. But this prince didn't seem to be the least bit upset. Bye. Nero boringly threw the white lizard to the ground before turning his back on Felix and walking away. Hey, sparkling prince. No matter how bored you are, you better not mess with my favorite, okay? If he chattered any longer, his true identity might be noticed. Therefore, Nero only muttered to himself. He bared his sharp teeth and laughed viciously. If you try to break Monica, I'll eat your head off. The white lizard that had been thrown to the ground will, bowed to Felix once he changed into his human form. I apologize for my lack of power. Let me go after that man right now. No, that's fine. It would be a problem if you got eaten. To Felix's joking remark, Will hanged down his head as if ashamed of his lack of ability. Felix had no further intention of chasing after the dark-haired young man. He has no idea who that young man was, but he instinctively knew that he was not someone he could chase down and get rid of. He's sure a non-human. But, he's not a spirit, but something else. However, whoever that non-human was, as long as he had no intention of harming Felix, he could be left alone for now. Will, go back to your lizard form. It would be a little inconvenient if Cyril saw you now, as you wish. Will, who had taken the form of a white lizard, slithered up Felix's leg and settled into his pocket. After confirming this, Felix resumed carrying Cyril on his back and started walking. Soon, Cyril moaned softly behind Felix's back. Apparently, he had regained consciousness. Ugh. I. Felix spoke calmly to Cyril, who muttered in a hushed voice. You're awake. Your. Highness. Cyril blinked a few times and looked at Felix with blurry eyes. You were collapsed in the forest after suffering from magic poisoning. A kind traveler brought you here. I'm sorry to trouble you. No, it's fine. If it had been the usual Cyril, he would have immediately said that he would walk by himself. However, the fact that he hadn't was because he was so worn out. After Felix carried Cyril back to his room, laying him on his bed, Cyril looked up at Felix with dazed eyes. Is the traveler who helped me a small, hooded figure? Felix shook his head. No. He was a tall, dark-haired man. I, see. Muttering, Cyril closed his eyes. Suddenly curious, Felix asked him. What kind of hallucinations did you have in the forest? Cyril was silent for a moment, seemingly confused. Behind his closed eyelids, he was probably ruminating on the dream he had seen. Eventually, with his eyes still closed, Cyril slowly opened his mouth. That monster in my hallucination, was terribly quiet and terribly strong. I probably will never forget that sight for the rest of my life. V3C8, a small hand in his memories. As Roth GT Silent Witch May 12th, 2021 4 minutes. After stopping Cyril's outburst, Monica returned to her room in the dormitory and by the time she finished writing the report to submit to Lewis, Don had completely fallen. Back when she was living in a mountain cabin, staying up all night was an everyday occurrence, but since she has been living a regular life for a while now, she was feeling heavy-headed. 
After walking dizzily to class, having been given another scolding for a bad haircut by Lana, fighting sleepiness throughout the class, Monica dragged her feet to the student council room. No one seemed to have arrived at the student council room yet. Apparently, Monica was the first to arrive today. Monica briefly cleaned the student council room as Cyril had taught her, restocked the supplies, and opened the ledger. Usually, looking at the numbers would make her become more awake, but right now she couldn't get the numbers into her head at all. I see. I've been using a lot of magic yesterday. I don't have enough sugar. Monica, who was not fussy about eating, always consumes only the minimum amount of food. For breakfast, she had a piece of bread left over from dinner and coffee. For lunch, she brought some nuts and water. Normally, this would be enough for her, but after the day of using a lot of magic, that's still not enough for her. Performing magic takes a lot of energy. Therefore, many magicians are said to have sweet tooth. Monica rummaged in her pockets for something to eat. But there was nothing to eat since she had eaten all the nuts at lunch. Just a little more patience until the student council work is done, so she told herself, but Monica gave in to sleepiness and plopped down at her desk. While Monica plopped down sleeping on the ledger, someone opened the door to the student council room. The door was opened by the vice president, Cyril Ashley. He was the second person to arrive at the student council room, and when he noticed Monica sleeping on her desk, he raised his eyebrows. He almost opened his mouth to yell at Monica, but kept his mouth shut. He unconsciously silencing his footsteps walked up to the desk, then looked down at Monica's figure. She's sure a small girl. Her scrawny little body didn't look like that of a 17-year-old girl. Her complexion was always pale, and her eyes, which could be brown or green depending on the light, were always downcast in fear. Without any noble grace or beauty, she was just a dull girl who could be found anywhere. Cyril stared down at Monica's right hand, which was still holding the quill. At Serendaya Academy, gloves are part of the uniform. Most of the girls wear custom-made gloves usually with lace or ribbons around the edges, but Monica's gloves were white and unadorned. The gloves were not the right size, or perhaps there was a little too big. That's how small her hands were, just like a child's. Cyril gently picked the quill out of Monica's hand and put it back in the quill holder. The moment the quill was taken out of her hand, Monica's right hand lost its strength allowing her fingertips to glide across the desk. Cyril covered Monica's right hand with his own as if to ascertain the smallness of her hand. Oh, Cyril, you're already here, aren't you? The moment he heard Felix's voice from behind, Cyril jumped away from the desk like a grasshopper. Your Highness, you're wrong, this little girl is napping in the sacred student council room, so I thought I'd wake her up. Come on, wake up, you little girl. Cyril smacked Monica's head with his right hand, which he lifted unnaturally. Monica, who had been plopped down on the desk, raised her upper body with a muffled grunt and looked up at Cyril with eyes that were still mildly sleepy. Lord Ashuli. H. Humph, what's with the stupid face? You're in the presence of his highness? Stand up straight. 91 29 14,771, 23,900, 38,671, 62,571, 101,242, 163813. Speak in human language. When Cyril clutched Monica's head in a tremble, but Monica only stared up at Cyril's face and smiled widely. Not cold anymore, that's a relief. Cyril's dark blue eyes widened and the hand that was trembling on Monica's head stopped. Unconsciously, his hand had touched the brooch on his lapel. 
When Cyril's mouth was opening and closing as he was about to say something, Felix's hand reached out from the side and shoved one of the cookies into Monica's mouth. In a drowsy stupor, Monica bit down on a cookie, crisply. Felix shoved a piece of the cookie, which was gradually getting smaller from the edges, into Monica's mouth, then took out another new cookie and brought it closer to Monica's mouth. After noticing the cookie pressing against her lips, Monica was still dazedly proceeded to bite into the second cookie. Interesting. She's half asleep, but her mouth is moving. Um, why your highness? Do you want to try it too, Cyril? His tone of voice sounded as if he was inviting someone to interact with his pet, but Cyril refused it, shaking his head. Just as Felix about to pick the third cookie on his hand, Monica's head snapped up and her eyes opened slightly. Monica rubbed her eyes and mumbled something in an indistinct voice as if she had just woken up from sleep. At this time, Monica was thinking about the report she had stayed up all night writing. For Monica, writing reports was one of the tasks she was very bad at. I hope Louis wouldn't get mad at me was what all Monica could think about, and the young man yelling at her in front of her seemed to overlap with Lewis Miller. So she was saying, Congratulations on your wife's pregnancy. Who are you talking about? To the shouting Cyril, Felix softly said, Cyril, who is it? You have to take responsibility for your actions, okay? Ah, uh, your highness? No, it's a misunderstanding. This little girl is just talking nonsense in her sleep. There was Cyril who's shouting with bloodshot eyes, Felix who's smiling happily, and Monica who still dozed off. No one had noticed this, but that scene caused Neil, the fourth boy who arrived at the student council room, to pause at the entrance with a troubled look on his face.